this morning. I'd like to shift the lens on our conversation around the built environment and talk about the city and scratch beneath the surface of the city to look beyond the buildings, beyond the public realm, and to look at the services that actually energise our cities. So welcome to the City of Adelaide, designed by Colonel William Light, and I assure you there's no pun intended in that. <laughs> it's true that we live in unprecedented times. Um, the urbanisation that's occurring within the world is, is unknown. Uh, it, we've never experienced anything like this before, in that uh, over 50% of the world's population are living within cities, and that trend is continuing to grow. Within Australia, uh, over two-thirds of our population live within cities, and in South Australia, where we live, it's even higher. So it's no surprise that our cities are growing and they're getting hungrier. They're getting hungrier for resources, for human capital, for social capital, for uh, energy. And uh, it's, it's that trend that we're seeing in terms of the demand for energy at a global scale. On the left-hand side, we have a chart of global projections around energy demand, which demonstrate for developed countries uh, the increases in, in energy consumption that we've been having there. You'll note that there is a blip, and that reflects, I think, what's been happening with the global financial crisis, and there is a general tapering out in terms of energy. So things are starting to slow, but still the consumption is incredible. But when you look on the right to the developing countries, you'll note that there is an incredible escalation in the demand for energy. These are the developing countries where cities are built in time faster than it takes to get some development approvals in some of our developed countries here. <laughs> What's interesting to note is that the residential energy use per household at a global level is actually decreasing. It appears that we are actually getting more efficient in the way we use energy in our households. But I will note that from this chart that in developed countries we are still far in excess exceeding the amount of energy that's um, um, required and, and, and used by developing countries there. So there is, there is a problem, there is a disconnect. But for me, the big issue, at least four times a year when I sit around the kitchen table with my family and receive our electricity bill, is this dilemma. If we're supposed to be um, improving our performance and reducing our consumption, why, oh why, do our electricity bills continue to rise? And when you look at this particular chart, you'll note that here in South Australia, we have some of the highest prices for electricity uh, in, in all of Australia, and indeed in the world, it's some of the highest prices per kilowatt hour that are experienced. I also note the increasing trend in our media uh, in terms of discussing performance around the energy markets there. And I'm, I'm baffled, confused, and to a degree angered about words that start to emerge about our energy markets being broken. Concepts around fuel poverty that are starting to emerge. Concepts about resilience and, and this notion about energy markets and, and the, the sense that um, we're powerless to actually operate. We, we're trying to be efficient and yet the costs are just escalating. Part of the solution rests in when we do look at our electricity bills as to where this price is coming from. I live in a home, we're trying to be efficient, we've got um, solar panels in place, we've got uh, various technologies that try and improve the performance, but when I look at my electricity bill, the largest part of that comes from both the generation costs that I'm paying for and the transmission costs that I'm paying for. And you note in the chart the trend that we're increasing gradually in terms of those significant charges that are actually beyond my control. One of the aspects that we do have in, in Australia is we have wide open spaces. We have an abundance of natural resources. We have an, an availability to tap into wind resources and solar resources. But there is a disconnect between our, our energy planning and our urban planning. And, and it's associated with the tyranny of distance. If we look at South Australia, for example, our urban settlements are located in, in, in certain locations there but our uh, energy sources, our generation and our transmission are uh, long distances away. The closest wind farm that we have to the city of Adelaide, which is our major settlement here, is over 100 kilometres away. The other challenging aspect is that when we start to talk about bringing uh, these uh, sustainable energy sources closer to our city, uh, the community starts to react and say, well, I'd like the idea, but not in my backyard. And so there's a social dilemma as well that we have to deal with. But what concerns me most, and when I break down this issue about transmission and generation, is when you look at the losses that we occur in our existing system, which in effect is a 20th century system. So from 100 units of power that you might have at a uh, source point where you deliver fuel to a, an energy generator, there are losses of some 60% uh, associated with losses in heat uh, and, and the type of generation processes that occur. So if you've got some 40, 40 units of power that are being transmitted down the lines to our cities, but there are losses in transmission and losses associated with static electricity and, and just uh, losses associated with distance. So by the time the energy gets to my home, uh, you've only got some 30 units of that original 100 units of energy left. 
And then with the homes that we have, whilst they are getting more energy efficient, there are still losses that occur there. So out of a potential $100 that I might pay, I'm getting some $20 of value in terms of energy. That doesn't work for me. We need to evolve our current system of thinking from a supply-based system there, where we look at red dollars. Red because it makes me angry. Uh, and, and because we've got supply versus demand, and we'll get that supply at no matter what the cost. And we certainly experience it here in summer when we're paying up to $10,000 per megawatt hour for peak demand load energy. We need to evolve through, through the current um, thinking around green supply of energy, where we have um, uh, solar uh, photovoltaics, we have wind farms, we have renewable sources of, uh, renewable sources of energy um, collectively contributing to our energy um, supply system. But the problem with that is that we still are running dual systems. We have our uh, fossil world system and we have our green system and we're paying double the amount. So that doesn't work. For me, we need to move towards what I call the purple dollars. And that's really about where we start to integrate our supply and our demand within the city construct where we start to look at integrated energy systems that not only look at electricity, but also at heating and cooling, and, and the ways that we can tap into mixed use of buildings and, and the deployment of, of these resources around the city. There is a better way. In that way, it's not just about looking at potentially environmental benefits, but there's also social benefits and economic benefits. It's about reducing the cost of living. It's about increasing, increasing the competitiveness of our cities. So we need a better plan. A plan that looks at defining urban growth areas so that we can contain ourselves within a certain ratio, we can look at the resources and optimise those resources. We need to better understand the relationship between energy planning and urban planning, and we need to look at how we can optimise the way that energy is generated, transported and consumed. Such a plan obviously needs to look at the higher lofty ambitions around policy, looking at the economic transition towards a carbon economy, looking at reducing the carbon footprints, and embracing and enhancing the, um, the livability and the vibrancy within our cities. But essentially from an energy perspective, it is about looking at that holy trinity, looking at um, energy affordability, energy sustainability, and looking at security and resilience of supply. And it's finding that sweet spot in the mix of those that I'd like to take you to. We've been doing some research, I don't uh, expect you to read through all of those points there, but the research is about uh, understanding what drives us in this space about energy here in the 21st century. And um, there has been a noticeable change in the last uh, year or two from looking at the, the aspirations around carbon reduction and greenhouse reduction, very much more so towards the, the issues of affordability, the cost of living, the cost of doing business. And these are the things that are driving people's concerns around energy consumption, as well as looking at some potential um, um, failures in the marketplace that might be associated with um, bringing online some of the greener technologies, the, the failures that might occur between miscommunications between the energy planners and the urban planners. So I put to you the first of my propositions today, and that is that in order to optimise our energy potential for cities, we need to better understand the city's metabolism. Metabolism, what does that mean? Who's had breakfast here this morning? Hands up, quick. Thank you. Very good, you're all having your own little metabolic event at the moment. <laughs> Metabolism is a chemical process whereby we take in food, uh, we, we absorb that, and the, the body uh, creates its own energy supply to keep the body going, we generate heat, and, and we generate some waste product for that. Now, from an urban perspective, urban metabolism has been a concept that's been around for a number of years now, uh, and the same principles can be applied. Essentially, for a city, a city brings in its resources, it <coughs> consumes those, it generates waste, and it expels that waste. From an energy perspective, we can apply that same thinking, whereby we have natural resources that come into the energy cycle, we have a process whereby we generate electricity, so we're consuming that, it is transmitted, and then it's being um, used uh, in, in the various processes that we have that make up our city life. Squiggly diagram, as we spoke about earlier, uh, it gets much more complex when you start to overlay the, the energy metabolism with all of the other things that are going on with the city itself there. It gets so confusing, it's no wonder that our, our city leaders have difficulties in trying to grapple with some of the issues going on. I showed my son this particular diagram and he thought it was a maze, starting at one end trying to find his way out the other. And in effect, so I think it's, it's quite true. For me, when I try and explain metabolism of cities, for me it's fundamentally about the relationship between the land use of a city, the transportation that we have, and the infrastructure that binds it together. Overlaid with that is the relationship between carbon, energy, <coughs> and water. And it's those elements that come together to define what I believe is the metabolism of the city. We can map the metabolism of the city with tools such as urban heat mapping. 
Um, these tools are making use of uh, GIS and some of the visualisation aids that many of you in this room probably already use. And it helps us to start to understand the potential of the city in terms of looking at how it can help to generate its own energy supplies, optimise its own supplies, to create low carbon precincts, high carbon precincts, whatever it might be there. But there are new ways of actually identifying what makes up an energy plan. And this example we've got uh, from Canada, uh, from a, a city called Guelph, where they've undertaken community energy master planning to help to use the urban planning framework and optimise the way they use energy within the city so that you start to look at the use of kilowatts per square metre as, as a, a key indicator of the success and the vibrancy and the performance of the city. On the right, we have our own city of Adelaide where we're starting to have these discussions about what an energy plan might look like for Adelaide and where we might go with that one, starting with our existing infrastructure and then building from there. My second proposition to you is that by using urban planning as a design tool, we can optimise a city's metabolism. Uh, what this might lead to is in fact that we have limited urban sprawl within our cities. We look at densifying around hubs and the notion of transit-oriented developments and the notion of service hubs uh, comes into effect there and we can look at centralising energy supplies around those. Building of heat networks, I mentioned earlier that waste is one of those key products that is just expelled. There's a potential to tap into that waste and, and see that as a new resource for generating energy and, and, and electricity for cities. Avoiding new centralised plant. We have a lot of existing plant in place there. There are opportunities to either optimise the existing or indeed look at new plant. We need to explore those. And integrating in energy and planning processes are key things that we would focus on. In these ways, we can actually measure the metabolism of cities, both at a precinct scale, but in, indeed up to a citywide scale. And as I mentioned, it's about using tools that you already have in place, making use of uh, three-dimensional design tools, making use of uh, GIS tools, and making use of indicators that have been put in place by city leaders to help guide the direction of our cities. Here's an example where we look at a precinct within the city. Um, we've got an existing condition, there's a built form, we've got a transport network plugged into Fossil World Grid. There's a business as usual development that could occur on this site whereby we have buildings that come along one at a time there. There isn't a particular plan other than general planning consent and guidelines, but it really isn't sort of coordinating in terms of uh, energy efficiency improvements across that larger scale there. An informed solution might start to look at uh, mixed use development, uh, applying green buildings on the site there, looking at some uh, shared transportation opportunities, uh, maybe some solar panels on the buildings there. And an optimal solution can be then modelled to look at uh, the idea of distributed networks within a city, to look at the performance that can be deployed uh, and, and really starting to integrate through a master planned approach the performance of precincts within cities. And if you start to look at that, you can start to then link those precincts together to really optimise performance <coughs> and metabolism in the city. The modelling process that goes with the 3D design uh, again, with tools that we've already got in place there, can link in those indicators. So it goes beyond the design to look at the, the actual performance of cities and you can generate results that look at reductions in energy, reductions in water performance. But beyond the environmental, it's also about looking at vibrancy in the cities. So there are ways of actually measuring the metabolism now within our cities. And so the key benefits are that you can start to look at the integration of, of distributed infrastructure, uh, looking at cheaper ways of, to live in our cities, uh, looking at ways of uh, reduction in, in consumption through design and really about creating vibrancy in our cities. One of the uh, exciting um, cities, uh, city developments that I've seen recently is Barcelona where they've been looking at um, city planning in, in, um, in three dimensions. I'll just go back to that previous slide there. In effect, they, their view of the city is in three planes where they have what's happening at the ground level, which you would have experienced this morning walking around our city, uh, what's happening uh, below ground in terms of the servicing of the city and what's happening above ground in terms of um, rooftop use, solar access and the like. And uh, I find that it's a very exciting and, and in innovative way of, of approaching city planning so you can start to optimise what, what's occurring. From an energy perspective in our city, there are other promising trends that are emerging. We're starting to move away from the notion of supply and, and focusing on that integration of supply and demand. Uh, we're starting to look uh, at um, the notion of megawatts or power that we can avoid rather than constantly talking about how many megawatts does your power station generate. We're starting to look at um, systems-based thinking rather than object-based thinking. So how does an entire energy network work rather than just a um, particular plant online? Moving from heavy technologies towards smarter technologies 
And then finally, we're looking at a community that's been disaffected uh, to, to really looking at an empowered community that is taking some key action in this space. And in this regard, I'm very excited about uh, two quick examples from it from an, a more artistic perspective. This one in Finland, where some artists have worked in an installation to interpret what kilowatts actually look like visibly by projecting a community's energy uh, flow on a smokestack. Uh, so the, the green laser pointers actually demonstrate what the community is, is, is using or consuming in, in live time. And in this particular installation, they demonstrated that where the community looked to reduce its energy consumption, the green cloud actually grew bigger as people were doing that over that period of time. So you can imagine something like that for Earth Hour occurring here. So very exciting about how you can actually use art to interpret what uh, consumption is about and, and metabolism is about. The other one is from the Netherlands where there's an installation uh, called D-Station which captures the pulse of the city through, through energy. Again, people can log on at home and, and tell how they're feeling and community-wide they can actually collectively demonstrate through the colours that are projected how a city is actually feeling from being angry to being uh, positive to being in love. Uh, and we all want to be in love, so purple there is the good colour in that sense. So it's some interesting examples of how we can use energy to help capture the vibrancy and, and the metabolism of our city. So energy master planning can help us to optimise um, city metabolism. We can rethink the way we actually approach energy utilities, the way we address consumption within our cities. Uh, we can shift energy planning towards a more local level rather than being centralised, rather than having plants that are hundreds of kilometres away from our cities, looking at how we can generate and consume electricity and energy within our cities. And it's about adopting an integrated approach towards supply and demand, towards the way our, our city leaders actually collaborate between energy planning and the like. Thank you very much.